Welcome to the Voc Talk Cafe by Après Cours. And this is a place where we get to chat live about teaching our trade. On the Après Cours website, there is the access to all the recordings and summaries from previous meetings. You have access to the meeting agenda in the collaborative document. You can sign up to the calendar so you can see all the meetings that are coming up and the topics. And at the bottom of the page, you see any resources that we share with you or that get discussed uh, that other people in the meeting bring up. We add them to the we add the links to the resource library. So on the website, there's lots of collaborative documents and resources. A word before we get started, this is a pilot project. So your anything you have to say really is important because it's about creating a space for you as teachers and as VT stakeholders um, to have a space where you can talk to people about teaching a trade. So any suggestions you have are definitely, we, we'd love to hear them. Today, October 23rd, we are going to, oh, it's not 2024, it's 2023. I'm, <laughs> I'm a little bit off. Today we are going to talk Robin? about uh, the internet creator culture in aesthetics. And we have myself, Robin Long, and we have Marc Vizina from RECVT, who are acting as your hosts today. Today's goals. So today, we want to identify some aspects of social media that connect with trade culture. We want to recognize the professional development aspect of creator culture. And we want to discuss some of the advantages and challenges of this topic for your teaching practice. The way this session works is it's always divided into two parts. There's the presentation part, which is where we spend about 10 to 15 minutes talking about the theme. And this part is recorded. And then the second part, which is the interaction, which is our discussions, where we open up the mic and we ask the teachers to discuss this topic amongst themselves. This part is not recorded. And we do that to create a safe space for everybody to talk. We do take notes and we make sure that we write down what the topics and what, what people are discussing, but we make sure that it's uh, we don't identify the notes with any one person. We come back at the end to the presentation and we do a recording again, and we're gonna talk about uh, the technology and teaching inspiration capsule, where how we can integrate some technology tools into our teaching. Let's go ahead and get started. So beauty care, so the aesthetics, uh, aesthetics, so beauty care, because we try and do this by, by sector. So uh, for all the trades that, that touch on beauty care, so um, uh, this would be hairdressing and aesthetics and hair removal. Um, what's it like teaching these trades in the age of internet creator culture? And so this, this one was really interesting. So I spent a lot of time <laughs> researching this and, and, Man, there's so much material out there. But what I came to realize is that there's nothing, nobody, this is so new and it's changing so fast. There's a lot of um, uncertainty as to a lot of what this is. But internet creator culture, they've, they've come to a, sort of this agreement that it's about leveraging social media platforms to commercialize and professionalize content. And that there isn't a link between online and offline. It's not strictly online. They're leveraging these platforms, but there's still a lot of stuff happening in real life. It's a little bit different from user-generated content, which is more about self-expression. And, and it doesn't have that element of making money, of commercialization. But the definitions are not clear and they're not exclusive. So... One person will use the word content creator. Somebody is going to use the word influencer. Somebody will say that they're a professional vlogger or a brand-friendly creator. And there's no set definition as to any of these. So this is also, in doing the research, this was kind of like, ah, okay. So today, in the studies I was reading, which were 2020, 2021, 2022, we're saying content creator is about making money, well, three years from now, that definition might change because, and this moves very, very quickly. So the definitions aren't clear, but what exactly do they do? I mean, we've heard these terms before, but what do content creators do? Well, <laughs> they're really turning uh, media and marketing on its head. They're leveraging platforms to, and they're going after a whole new way of, of making money. And they're doing this through 
leveraging the tools of the platforms. And so they're making tutorials, but they're doing the tutorials in a way that's educational. So yes, I'm going to show you how to use this certain tool, or I'm going to use this product, and I'm going to show you what you can do with it. But they're doing it in the form of, of what you call edutainment, which is where it's entertainment, but it's educational at the same time. And this is sort of coming out of years of watching television. You know, we started back in the 60s with content for children. And we said that people can learn off the television. And this has just sort of followed us up throughout the years using visual medium. So the tutorials that they're making are not just about how to use a product, there's an entertainment feature to them as well. They also make, uh, they also talk about products and they talk about how they're gonna apply them, how they review products, they unbox them and they talk about it. And then they talk about it in a very specific situation. So a lot of the times content creators are, are connecting with certain communities. And so they'll be talking about applications of a product within that community and how it applies to the values of that community and, and some of the, the, the the aspects of the community that make that community unique. Uh, they also have it as a personal style showcase where what they're making, the, 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 the content that they're generating really is about showing their personal style and what they want clients to see. So a client uh, or an audience outreach. But then it's also about experimentation because a lot of content creators will actually have multiple platforms where they're going after different aspects of what they want to do on these different platforms. It's about networking and keeping up, not just keeping up with industry trends, but being part of industry trends. And then they're also going to do a lot of collaborations and a lot and, and a lot of sponsorship because the sponsorship is a lot of times where they're making their money. So some of the common platforms for aspirational content. And so what this idea of aspirational content is, is this is stuff that we aspire to be to. And it's not unique to beauty care when we think about food, the food world, which is where I'm from as a professional cook. When people post images on Instagram, a lot of the times that's aspirational. Here's this beautiful plate of food and I, I'm sharing this with you to inspire you. And so people consuming this will look at it and say, oh yeah, I'm, I wanna aspire to do something similar to that or to have that level of creativity. And so these are just three common platforms for aspirational type content, Instagram, TikTok, and, and uh, YouTube, but there are others and we all know these other ones. Um, but what they allow you to do is Instagram is about sharing images, collages of images, short videos, or live streams. TikTok is more about short videos and then the effects you can do with those short videos, such as stitching and commentary. Then there's the live stream option also on TikTok. And then there, on YouTube, there's video and live stream. And each one of those platforms has different parameters to using those. But what makes them all what makes them all the same is they uh, what what they all have in common is they all have an ability to connect with audiences. So there's always that idea of tagging or or hashtagging either individuals or topics. Um, and the audience can leave comments. They're also really designed for mobile devices. They absolutely can be used on a computer, but they're much more friendly to mobile devices. And you do have descriptive text in them, but it's usually quite limited. So why do we, why does aspirational content gravitate towards social media? Well, one of the number one things is that it's accessible, the low barriers to get in. Once you have a smartphone, you create an account and that's it, you're in. Everything else is contained within the software of the, the, the either the phone, so the hardware of the phone, like the camera and the mic, or the software of the, of the platform. It's a great medium for self-expression and connecting with a self-interest. So if I happen to be interested in, you know, we're in aesthetics here. So let's, if I happen to be in interested in hairstyles for people with uh, very curly hair, I can find that community and that's an interest of mine and I can connect with that community. I can also uh, express myself in, in that community and and with the things that I'm interested in, my values. Uh, social media is about user-generated content. So it's about me contributing as opposed to somebody feeding me. 
Think about it as opposed to magazines where I don't have the ability to contribute. I just have the ability to consume in social media. It's a two-way street. And it's about, so we talked a little bit about connecting with the community, but it's also about diversity and inclusion. And this is, and it's the democratization of it. It is no longer somebody else saying that community doesn't need a voice. Nobody pays attention to them because that community can make its own voice. It's also about authenticity. One of the strong points of social media is that, and I, I put in the word controlled because <laughs> often it's authentic but it's authentic in a way that I want to make sure that people see only one side of the authenticity. There are definitely people out there putting up videos where, or putting up content where it really is just a, there's no editing, there's no, there's no Photoshopping, there's one take and that's it and up it goes. But a lot of the times we plan this out ahead of time and there's this balance to walk but behind me being who I am and me me creating a, a usable experience for the audience. There's also that possibility of feedback that the the comments and the ability for people to comment and interact with me is uh, is is a really important part of social media. Uh, we talked about aspirational culture. Just a little side note, and this is not where I'm going to stop talking about the money part because like at some point it's like, okay, none of us, <laughs> I don't know how many people here actually want to become content creators <laughs> and make a bunch of money, but it's good to frame it out and understand like when, you know, you have somebody coming to you saying, well, I'm going to become a YouTuber. It's good to frame it out a little bit as to what exactly, how do you make money off these platforms? And just like any other creative professions, it's really hard work with a lot of very uneven results. It's not because you do, all, if you check all the right boxes and you do everything right, it doesn't mean you're going to make a ton of money. So often the money is coming from the platform itself. So once you get to a certain number of users, then the platform itself will actually pay you. Uh, there's the advertisements on the platform. There are partnerships between brands and other content creators. There's product endorsement and usually a training, but the training will often happen in another platform or in real life. So you would contact the person to have them give training. But those are usually the ways that content creators make money. And often they're, they're because because they're at the whim of the way the platform's algorithm works. And if a platform decides to change its algorithm, which they do all the time, they can lose a lot of followers because all of a sudden it's not acting the way it usually does. So a lot of content creators will, will go between multiple platforms. So for example, they might combine both TikTok and Patreon or Instagram and Etsy or X and Substack. Like there's lots of combinations possible. But a lot of times they're doing that and that's just so that they don't get caught by the algorithm. So let's frame this out more in an education because, okay, all that's really cool, but like <laughs> we're inside vocational training. So what makes this so interesting for us in education? Well, the cool thing about content creation um, or user generated content is that it's really learning from experience and it's that connection between I want to get to that point and I'm going to try to get there and I'm going to, I'm going to experiment and, 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 and get it to a point where I get it right. And you're understanding how these things are connected. And so social media really is a learner centered type uh, uh, learning tool where it emphasizes all these different entry points um, where you can pursue through personal interest a topic and you get social support, you get support from a community. So it compensates for that disconnect sometimes between real world learning and what's happening in the classroom, where sometimes we feel like what we're learning isn't really the way it goes in real life. But because as uh, with social media, I can control as the user, I can control the topic and the way I want to learn. It's more focused on my learning. And that that the meaningful um, relationship, the meaningful nature of learning through social connection is a huge uh, plus point in social media. 
because you're getting that immediate feedback. You're connecting with people that are interested in similar topics that can bring in a point of view, that can bring in some expertise as well. Because although there's, we all know there's a lot of junk on the internet, but when you're connecting with a community and you start to establish these relationships, there's a very high standard for the expertise in these relationships. Um, because people who are frauds will immediately sort of drop off your radar. You're not going to want to engage with them. And so here, the example we have here is the Wikipedia, which, you know, we all know, don't believe everything you see on Wikipedia, but Wikipedia is a great example of people coming together from a community to share information and collaborate to create information that's viable and, and um, that benefits a population at large using the expertise of that community. And if you notice, like in Wikipedia, they're always citing their sources and you can check the links. And whenever something's questionable, they'll always put it in as, oh, we need a source for this. We need a source for this. So once you have a community built, there's a high standard for expertise. And the design principles of these connected learning environments is really the, the, the sort of that democratization and that learning by doing. So everyone can participate and we're all learning empirically. The emphasis isn't necessarily on the goal. That's what appears on the site, but there's in order to get there, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to learn and learn and learn. And that that process of learning, making a mistake, fixing, learning, making a mistake, fixing, that process is, is highly valued in, in these connected learning environments. And when you're, you know, so what exactly are you learning when you're dealing with generating content? So whether it's a, you're a content, uh, creator or whether we're talking about user generated content well we're learning how the platform works and we're learning how to manipulate it so like i mentioned before when we talk about the algorithms even though they call that uh what do they call that folk algorithms where a lot of times it's it's the um the people on the platform that give each other information on how how when they had a positive outcome so they might share that information where they say look if you do this on instagram you'll reach more followers. So a lot of time it's that grassroots type sharing, but they're learning how to use and manipulate that software. They're learning about a topic and any related subjects. So although they're the ones choosing the topic, they're a lot, it's not just the topic in its bubble within it's connecting with different spheres of influence. So it could be the topic if we go back to our curly hair, it could be that it's the curly hair, but there would be related subjects with that. It'll be product with the curly hair. It'll be hair, hair cuts and trends. It'll be the role of culture with curly hair in different societies. It'll be, uh, it'll be these adjacent topics. They're learning about communication skills. So both oral and visual communication skills. They're learning data analysis because all those comments that come in and all the uh, analytics that you get from the site that feeds you information. And if you're trying to grow a following, well, you're gonna pay attention to that. So if you're seeing all these comments and let's say they're pointing in a direction where it'll be about, oh, they notice that they like, uh, you know, people comment positively when I give little tidbits of information about my personal life, but without identifying myself too personally, uh, but sort of this authentic view into my life as who I am as a human, oh, I get little bumps. So they can take that information and then reinvest it into into their into their their vision of their of 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 their um, of their uh, their self that they have on these platforms. They're learning marketing and branding because if they're trying to expand and grow their network. You have to understand how to analyze, once again, your data. You have to analyze how to reach your audience, what type of an audience you're going after, the branding, the, the design aspects. Uh, you're, uh, so you're looking at your target audience and your client outreach. Who's this going to be for? What type of content are they interested in? And the way that the content is delivered. And you're also learning how to problem solve because a lot of times you're faced with these problems and you're often leveraging the community to help you solve these problems. So collaboration is very, very high in these situations. So with that, our key takeaways that is that engagement really depends on the affordances of the chosen platform. And 
it, I'm not going to venture as far as to say, oh yeah, this is the platform for people who are hairdressers. This is the platform to be on. <laughs> I'm not going to venture that far, but there's definitely platforms that have uh, more affinity with certain types of uh, trades or certain types of content than others. We also saw that there's a large uh, potential for um, professional use in non-traditional ways. So creating these new avenues of revenue and these new professionalizations uh, that didn't exist before. Um, there's also uh, the personal interest and in social connectivity are motivators for informal learning. So this is definitely a way that people can learn. And that one final one is kind of really interesting for us in VT because we know that our students don't need to be in our programs. They choose to be there. And so we're setting up formal learning situations but they can learn informally. And in order to sort of meet the students in both worlds, how can we leverage some of these, the affordances of these systems to go after that ability for them to learn informally? Mark, you want to do technology inspiration. Okay. <laughs> so everybody, when we imagined this a new version of the Vok Talk Cafe, we decided to include a, a minute where I would present quickly a uh, technological approach or pedagogical angle that kind of fits the the, the topic of the day um because the mandate of the reci is to support integration of technology and teaching and learning so um so today i decided to talk to you about the idea of building a, a class website uh, where students would be invited to po post their uh, contributions either po pictures of their work uh, items of parts of collaborative project feedback on each other's work information that they find on social media or the internet personal reflection or questioning career ambitions and stuff so the the the, the idea would be to promote student engagement self-reflection communication skills digital literacy all in one sphere and a bit of an approach that is very collaborative and where the students are teaching each other um, there are many platforms to do that uh, my original idea and it's not a mandatory but it it need it should be considered to make it public or private if you make it public on a platform like a SharePoint or a Google site or WordPress, then there's a notion of rayonnement and, and offering it to the public that can be stimulating for students and close to the trade as well, uh, which you can't do if you use your uh, learning management platform like Teams or Classroom or Moodle. Uh, social media is a good would be a good place to do that as well but there are uh, and i'm going to conclude on that ethical considerations to be taken into uh to be looked into uh you can't force a student to open an account on a social media to participate in the class activity um and also we have to be aware that we're generating content for companies that are going to make profit out of it so it it's not forbidden, but it because there are considerations to uh, do uh, this. Uh, to finish, uh, I'm gonna the, you have on the screen the address of the CVT uh, website. It's easy to memorize. If you need help with uh, your integration of technology in your work, we we are there for you. I will post the link in the chat as well, and also the, the link to register to our monthly newsletter, bite sized news. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, before we close up, are there any questions about anything related to anything? <laughs> I guess let's say VT related. <laughs> okay, so with that, if you'd like to, we would encourage you to continue this discussion on vt.proceed.ca, which is an example of a social, a closed social media site. This is a social networking site that's run by Proceed where we can connect um, with other trade teachers across the province. So you join your trade group and you can dis start a discussion thread or respond to a current discussion thread. And uh, if you want, you need any help, there's a little chat button right on the uh, website. And if you would take a moment to fill out the, the exit ticket form, it helps us um, tailor the Vok Talk Cafe so that it meets your needs and expectations. And of course, we're always looking for teachers who uh, have an idea and would like to uh, be a guest and showcase um, a topic of interest for them.
and for their trade. So you can do that by filling out this quick form. And I think, Mark, you're dropping all those links in there, it's right? It's already done, my dear. All righty. Thank you very much. Yeah. So if there's anything else, go ahead and contact us. And with that, there's the list of resources from the research that we did. And next week's Rock Talk Cafe, October 30th, uh, from three to four. We don't have our topic yet. We're kind of hoping to lock down a topic, but we're not totally sure if that's going to happen. But stay tuned. You'll get the information on Thursday. And thanks very much for coming, everyone. <laughs>